Shalom. Today we're going to be talking about a rather controversial uh, doctrine that was followed by the Ebionites, the original followers of Yeshua. And I'm, I've entitled this teaching, I Came to Abolish Sacrifices. It's about the controversy between the Nazarenes and the Temple. So, in the Panarion of Epiphanius, where Epiphanius is writing about the Ebionites, he says that their so-called gospel says, I came to abolish the sacrifices, and if you cease not from sacrifice, wrath will not cease from you. They lay down certain ascents and instructions in the supposed ascents of James, as though he were giving orders against the temple and the sacrifices and the fire on the altar. So, uh, the first half of this quote where he says, I came to abolish sacrifices. If you cease not from sacrifice, wrath will not cease from you. That's a quote that the Ebionites actually attributed to Yeshua. And of course, Yeshua's brother James, according to Epiphanius, they, uh, the Ebionites had a doctrine that came from a document known as the Ascents of James, in which he was presented as being in the temple and preaching against the temple and against the sacrifices. So we're going to look into this. We're going to see if there's any uh, indication that maybe the sacrifices were not part of Yeshua's will. So you may be asking yourself, how could Yeshua possibly be against the sacrifices? And you may ask yourself some version of these questions. You know, wasn't the temple the center of Jewish religious observance? Wouldn't Yeshua and his family have went to the temple to sacrifice like all good Jews, and such and so forth? However, I think if we look into this matter with an open mind, we might be surprised with what we find. Now, keep in mind that we also have a doctrine from the Ebionites that whereas they affirm the Torah given to Moses, uh, they did deny that the Pentateuch, the first five books of your Bible that we have today was that actual Torah. They believe that the Torah had been uh, corrupted over time. So here's an example of that doctrine in the Panarion, chapter 30. Chapter 30 is the one about the Ebionites. He says, uh, nor do they accept Moses' Pentateuch in its entirety. They reject certain sayings. When you say to them of eating meat, why did Abraham serve the angels, the calf, and the milk? Why did Noah eat meat? And such and so forth, that this Ebionite will disbelieve those things and say, what need for me to read what is in the law when the gospel has come? So what did this, what did this saying mean about why do I need to read the Torah when the gospel has come? Well, that's basically a, a doctrine of the Ebionites, the true prophet doctrine. The Ebionites realized that Yeshua, uh, as the true prophet, his purpose for coming was to turn the people back to the original eternal Torah, the Torah the way it was given by Moses. And this is something you can see in the Gospels, particularly uh, Matthew chapter 5, where Yeshua is giving a sermon on the mount, and he's... Uh, quoting from the Torah, and then he follows that up with his own understanding or his own interpretation. For instance, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you, don't even look at a woman with lust in your eyes. Or you've heard it said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, but I tell you that you need to have uh, justice and mercy and forgiveness as examples. So, also in the Panarion, Chapter 18, which is the section or the chapter on the Nazareans. Now, quite often, when Epiphanius is talking about these uh, so-called Jewish Christian groups, he will mention that this group or that group follows the school of the Nazareans. And so you go to the section on the Nazareans, and you can see what exactly uh, this school was. Uh, he says here in chapter 18, uh, section 1, verses 3 through 4, says that it is also recognized as fathers the persons of the Pentateuch from Adam to Moses who were illustrious of the excellence of their piety, 
however it, uh, it being the school, would not accept the Pentateuch itself. It acknowledged Moses and believed that he had received legislation, but not this legislation, though, they said, but some other. And so, though they were Jews who kept all the Jewish observances, they would not offer sacrifice or eat meat. In their eyes, it was unlawful to eat meat or make sacrifices with it. They claim that these books are forgeries and that none of these customs were instituted by the fathers. So again, you see that they did confirm the Torah, and they believed in the Torah. They just disputed whether the five books of Moses that you have in your Bible was that actual Torah. They believed that it had been added to. So, uh, and that's the reason I'm, normally I don't say, I don't use the word Pentateuch. I usually stick to Torah, but in order to differentiate between the law and the actual five books, that's why I'm using uh, the Pentateuch here. So, in the Nazarene Acts, uh, also known as the, the recognitions of Clement, Peter is quoted as saying that sacrifices were not the original plan. In uh, the Recognitions of Clement, Book 1, Chapter 36, he says that when meantime Moshe, that faithful and wise steward, perceived that the vice of sacrifices to idol had been deeply ingrained into the people from their association with the Mitzrites, and that the root of this evil could not be extracted from them, he allowed them sacrifices but permitted it to be done only to Yahuwah, that by any means he might cut off one half of the deeply ingrained evil, leaving the other half to be corrected by another, and at a future time by him, namely, concerning whom he said himself, a prophet will Yahuwah your Elohim raise up to you. So basically, Kepha saying that because Moses knew that he couldn't get the people to stop sacrificing to idols, he just instead got them to put away the idol, but allowed them to continue sacrificing with the understanding that this future prophet, the true prophet, was going to come along that was going to turn them away from the sacrifices. He goes on to say, in addition to these things, he also appointed a place in which it alone should be lawful for them to sacrifice to Yahuwah. And all this was arranged with this view that when the fitting time should come and they should learn by means of Yeshua that Yahuwah desires mercy and not sacrifice, and they might see him who should teach them at the place chosen by Yahuwah in which it was suitable that victims should be offered to Yahuwah in his hakma, that's wisdom, and, and that on the other hand they might hear that this place, which seemed chosen for a time, often harassed as it had been by hostile invasions and plunderings, was at last to be wholly destroyed. So uh, he, he's going on to say that Yahuwah appointed Jerusalem alone to be the only place they could sacrifice and that because Jerusalem was often overthrown by enemies um, that this was going to, uh, in the final destruction of Jerusalem, that would uh, stop them from sacrificing completely. And to finish up this quote, he goes on to say, and in order to impress a, this upon them, even before the coming of Yeshua, who was to reject at once the sacrifices and the place, it was often plundered by enemies and burnt with fire, and the people carried into captivity among foreign tribes, and then brought back when they betook themselves to the mercy of Yahuwah, that by these things they might be taught that a person, that a people who offer sacrifices are driven away and delivered up into the hands of the enemy, but they who do mercy and righteousness are without sacrifices freed from captivity, and restored to their native land. But it fell out that very few understood this. So what's Kepha saying here? Well, he's saying that, and to be honest with you, I've wondered about this. Why is it that these people were doing all the stuff they were supposed to do? They had the temple, they were making sacrifices. It seemed like every time that they would, if you read in the, in the Tanakh, it seemed like every time that they would turn back to the Torah and start making all these sacrifices, that's when Yahuwah would start warning them that the temple was about to be destroyed. In fact, just, I think it was only like 30 years before the destruction of the temple that you had, um, the law was discovered in the temple by Josiah, and there was this huge revival, and people were destroying all the pillars in the pagan temples, and, and, uh, you know, the sacrifices were reinstated, the temple was repaired, and all this 
things went on, and you think you would think that this would be the time that Israel would be brought back to the height of power, but it was just a few years later that Nebuchadnezzar came in and destroyed the temple. So according to Peter, the fact that they were making these sacrifices and then the temple was destroyed and they went into captivity, and then while in captivity, just by praying and entreating and begging for forgiveness, that Yahuwah gave them forgiveness and brought them back to the land, that in itself was meant to show them that sacrifices was not what was desired, that he never commanded sacrifices. But according to Kepa, very few people actually understood this. Now, the Ebionite point of view is not new. Since the temple has been destroyed for almost 2,000 years, the subject of sacrifices has not been a subject of debate for either Orthodox Christianity or even Judaism until fairly recently. However, there is abundant evidence in the Tanakh and the Apostolic writings that this was an area of controversy for ancient Israel. So this has really only become an issue in the last 20 years or so, when people have started really considering and thinking about the possibility of the temple being rebuilt in Jerusalem, and for many years there wasn't very much interest in it, but lately, probably thanks in part at least to the Hebraic Roots movement, there is this renewed interest in bringing back the temple and the sacrifices. Now, animal sacrifice has an ancient provenance. We see Abel making an animal sacrifice. Uh, Abraham, of course, prepared to offer Isaac, but it's given a ram instead. And according to the Torah, Moses is given instruction for sacrifice in the desert. Now, if you've done very much study on the scholarly side of biblical uh, textual criticism, you'll, you'll see that there is this hypothesis. It's known as the documentary hypothesis. And basically what this is, is that there's an understanding that the... Bible itself was originally separate works, but at some point, probably in the Babylonian captivity, the Bible was brought together really kind of into its final form by a person who's just simply referred to as the redactor, although it was more than likely several people. And most of these modern textual critics, they believe that the instructions on animal sacrifice was one of the last items incorporated into the Tanakh. And they actually date this incorporation of the sacrifices. They think it was probably done around the 6th century BC, right before the destruction of the first temple. And it was probably during the Babylonian captivity that the Bible really kind of took on its final form. Now, scholars called this this document that has all the sacrifices in it, they call it the P document. And they're actually able to go back and extract out these separate books. It's a very interesting hypothesis, and honestly, I think that it's the evidence is, is compelling. It would be difficult to really debate whether this hypothesis is not, in fact, uh, actual fact. So, in the Clementine recognitions, we have this episode where Kepha is not just Kepha, but it's all the apostles. They're, they're debating the priests in the temple. And this narrative in the Clementine Recognitions is the story that lines up with Acts, Acts chapter 7, which uh, it was the debate or the argument with the high priest that resulted in the stoning of Stephen. Now, in a previous teaching, I showed evidence that Stephen was actually a stand-in for James, and it was actually James who was the one in the temple giving that speech by Stephen, not, uh, not Stephen. And that whereas Stephen was stoned at the end of the speech, it was actually James who was thrown or cast down from the steps of the temple and left for dead. And we read that whole story in the first book of the Clementine Recognitions. But in chapter 63 through 64, Kepha says, uh, when he's in the middle of the debate with the priests, he says, Thus we argued and bore witness, and we who were unlearned men and fishermen taught the Kohanim concerning the unified Yahuwah of heaven. 
and that he is much rather displeased with sacrifices that you, the priests, offer. The time of sacrificing having now passed away, and because you will not acknowledge that the time for offering victims is now past, therefore the temple will be destroyed, and the abomination of desolation will stand in the devo devoted place, and then the gospel will be, will be preached to the goyim for a testimony against you, and your unbelief may be judged by their faith. So, um, you had this reference there where Kepha was saying that the time for sacrificing was passed away. Now, there was two opposing doctrines that are expressed in the Clementine Recognitions and the Clementine Homilies. Now, they're both re reportedly written by Clement, and in the Recognitions, the story is, is that Moses allowed the sacrifices with the understanding that Yeshua was going to come along and do away with sacrifices. However, in the homilies, the story is that Moses never commanded sacrifices and that instead it was somebody added the sacrifices later on. And this theory, this story that's being told by Kepha 2,000 years ago, actually fits with the modern day documentary hypothesis which was just uncovered about 100 years ago. So in Homilies, book 2, chapter 45, it says, But that he is not pleased with sacrifices is shown by this, that those who lusted after flesh were slain as soon as they tasted it, and were consigned to a tomb, so that it was called the grave of lust. He then, who at the first was displeased with the slaughtering of animals, not wishing them to be slain, did not ordain sacrifices as desiring them, nor from the beginning did he require them. So according to Homilies, it wasn't that Moses allowed it, it was that it was never commanded. Now, Kepha is referring back to this episode in the Torah, in Numbers chapter 11, where the mixed multitude uh, was in the midst of Israel, and they lusted greatly after meat, so that the children of Israel wept and said, Who was giving us meat to eat? We remember the fish we ate without cost in Mitzrayim, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, and the onions, and the garlic. But now our throat is dried up. There's nothing to look at but this manna. So here you have the people in the wilderness um, dwelling outside the tent of meeting in the camp of Israel, and they're lusting after meat. Now, have you ever read this and really thought about the situation? Because the Torah tells us that they came out of Egypt with herds of cattle and sheep and, and goats and, and all this livestock and they were making sacrifices in the wilderness. But according to this, the people were lusting after meat, and they were complaining because they had no meat to eat. And it begs the question, why didn't they just go and slaughter a lamb or a bull or cattle and have a, have a cookout? Well, going on in, in Numbers 11, it says, He who was said to Moses, to gather me seventy men of the elders of Israel, and say to the people, Set yourselves apart, for tomorrow you shall eat meat, because you have wept in the hearing of Yahuwah, saying, Who is giving us meat to eat? For it was well with us in Mitzrayim. And Yahuwah shall give you meat to eat, and you shall eat, until it comes out your nostrils and becomes an abomination to you, because you have rejected Yahuwah who is among you, and have wept before him, saying, Why did we come up out of Mitzrayim? Now, why is, you know, notice that Yahuwah is upset with them. He's upset with them because they're wanting to eat meat. Why were they not allowed to eat meat? We'll get into that later, but I think that the original plan, the plan that Yahuwah was wanting the people to go by, did not involve them eating meat. And, of course, Numbers 11, it uh, concludes with a wind coming forth from Yahuwah and bringing quail from the sea, uh, the people gathering the quail, the meat was still between their teeth before it was chewed, and the wrath of Yahuwah burned against the people, and Yahuwah smote the people with an exceedingly great plague. Then he called the name of the place uh, Kibroth Hata'awah, because there they buried the people who had lusted. So, again, you know, this is a really kind of a curious story. You know, why, why did Yahuwah have a problem with these people eating meat? It, it appears... Now, I know that you, you've probably thought about this and come to this conclusion that, well, it was just their attitude. It was just because they were complaining, because they were comparing 
Yahuwah to Mitzrayim, but there, would that really be something, just because people are upset and just because people are hungry, is that really a reason to slaughter them? However, if Yahuwah was telling the people he didn't want them to eat meat anymore, and the people were complaining and whining about it, that in itself may be an indication as to why he was upset with them. So, I will go on. Uh, it says, so, uh, opposition to sacrifices. Believe it or not, there is ample evidence in the prophets that the sacrifices were never commanded. So, Isaiah 111. Of what used to me are your many slaughterings, declares Yahuwah. I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courtyards? Stop bringing futile offerings. Incense, it's an abomination to me. New moons, Sabbaths, the calling of meetings. I'm unable to bear unrighteousness and assembly. And when you spread out your hands, I hide my eyes from you. Though you make many prayers, I do not hear. Your hands have become filled with blood. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, put away the evil of your doing from before my eyes. Stop doing evil. So here, Yahuwah himself is preaching against the sacrifices. He's telling the people to stop making sacrifices. He calls it an abomination. Now, you've probably heard it said that the problem was not the sacrifices, but it was the sin of the people. The people were involved in apostasy and were worshipping false gods. However, the text does not really support this interpretation. In fact, I read that from the uh, the scriptures by the Institute for Scriptural Research. It's a Hebraic Roots uh, translation. So, of course, they're translating it in a way to make, uh, so, so that you're supporting the doctrine of sacrificing. However, if you'll read from the NET, the New English Translation, it says, Of what importance to me are your many sacrifices? The blood of bulls and lambs and goats I don't want. Do you actually think I want this? Animals trampling my courtyard. And most of the English translations are very similar to this. The scripture version is actually kind of the minority. Most of these English translations, the mainstream English translations, all make it more apparent that Yahuwah is not against the sacrifices because of the sins of the people, but rather the sacrifices itself was the sin that he was coming against. Of course, later in Isaiah, at the end of Isaiah, Isaiah 66 says, Thus says Yahuwah, The heavens are my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is this house you have built for me? And where is the place of my rest? So, right here at the, at the first verse, he's setting the stage for saying that the subject of this, uh, the next few verses, is the temple. But notice he's not really painting the temple in a positive light. He's like, where is this house you built for me? Where is the place of my rest? Going on in verse 2, he says, And all these my hands have made. And all these that exist, declares Yahuwah. So what are these things that he has made? Well, you'll see in the next verse, he's talking about the sacrifices. He's saying, all my hands have made these things. It says, yet to such a one I look, on him who is poor and bruised a spear, who trembles at my word. But whoever slaughters the bull slays a man. Whoever slaughters a lamb breaks a dog's neck. Whoever brings a grain offering pig's blood. Whoever burns incense blesses an idol. Indeed, they have chosen their own ways, and their being delights in their abominations. I shall also choose their punishments and bring their fears upon them, because I called, and no one answered. I spoke, and they did not hear. And they did evil before my eyes, and chose what was displeasing to me. So, what's he saying here? I'll paraphrase it. Basically, what he's saying is, why are you bringing me these offerings? I've created all these things. Why are you taking the animals that I created and bringing them before me and slaughtering them before me? Why are you bringing me grain offerings? I don't need this stuff. I've never asked for it. And notice he says, you know, these people are following after their own hearts. Now this is not, as you may have heard, that the, the, he's talking about the pagan offerings. No, the, the first verse told you that he's talking about the sacrifices 
in his temple. And this is what he's saying about it. But it's not just Isaiah. You also have opposition from Amos. Amos 5.21. He says, I hate your festivals, nor do I delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer up to me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them. And I will not even look at the uh, peace offerings of your fat ones. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the sound of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an overflowing stream. So, what's he saying? He's saying, look, I, I, have, I don't want your, your offerings. He says, I won't even look at them. I'm not going to accept them. What I want is justice and righteousness. Let that sink in for a minute. It's not that he's saying that, that he'd rather have justice and righteousness. He's saying he does not want the sacrifices. Amos 5.25, he says, Did you bring me sacrifices and offerings during the 40 years in the wilderness, old house of Israel? Now, this is a rhetorical question. Now, if you looked in the Torah, Did you bring me sacrifices and offerings during the 40 years in the wilderness, old house of Israel? Well, the answer is, yes, of course we did. Moses says it all through Exodus and Leviticus that, that we did. But the, the rhetorical question is begging for a, the answer of no. He goes on to say, You shall take up Sukkoth, uh, your king, and Kiyun, your star god, your images that you made for yourselves, and I will send you into exile beyond Damascus, says Yahuwah, whose name is the Elohim of hosts. So, you know, this right here, Yahuwah appears to be saying that he never commanded sacrifices. And furthermore, they were not making sacrifices in the wilderness. Now, this would explain Numbers 11. If they were not making sacrifices in the wilderness, if they were not allowed to kill those herds of animals they had with them, then this would explain why the people were lusting after meat. And also, this lines up with Acts 7. It says, But Elohim turned away and gave them over to worship the host of heaven, as is written in the prophets, do you bring me slain beasts and sacrifices during the forty years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You took up the tent of Moloch and the star of your god Raphon, the images that you made to worship, and I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. So this is in the mouth of Stephen. You know, Stephen is, is quoting the verses from Amos that we just read. Now remember we have said in a previous teaching on James, uh, I believe the name of the teaching is uh, Paul, James, and the Stoning of Stephen. And you can find that on my YouTube channel. That we determined, or I determined in that teaching, that, that Stephen was actually a stand-in for James, and that it was actually James making that speech of Stephen. So, and then that comes back to the words of Epiphanius that I quoted at the beginning of this teaching, that said that there was this doc document known as the Ascents of James that the Ebionites had, which portrayed James teaching against the sacrifices in the temple. And then you hear Stephen here in the temple teaching against the sacrifices and the temple. This further supports my contention that Stephen is actually James. Not only that, but he goes on to say, that our fathers had the tent of witness in the wilderness, just just as he spoke to Moses, and or just as he spoke to Moses, directed him to make it according to the pattern that he has seen. Our fathers, in turn, brought it in with Joshua when they dispossessed the nations that Elohim drove out before our fathers. So it was until the days of David, who found favor in the sight of Elohim, and asked to find a dwelling place for the Elohim of Jacob. So here you have um, what appears to be a favorable presentation of the tabernacle but then he turns to speak about the temple and you get a negative impression about the temple it says but it was Solomon who built the house for him yet the most high does not dwell in houses made by hands as the prophet says heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool what kind of house will you build for me says Yahuwah or what is the place of my rest did not my hand make all these things now wait a minute we just read this verse also. This is the first and second verse of Isaiah 66. And the next verse in Isaiah 66 was preaching against the sacrifices. 
where Yahuwah says if you slay an ox, it's the same as killing a man. And again, this goes back to the Panarian, where he says that uh, the Ebionites had these ascents and instructions of James as though he were giving orders against the temple and the sacrifices and the fire on the altar. So here, again, you have further proof that Stephen and James, that, that they're actually the same person. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 20. Uh, verse 24 it says, Because they had not done my right rulings, and they rejected my laws, and they profaned my Sabbaths, and their eyes were on their father's idols, and I also gave them up to laws that were not good, and right rulings by which they could not live. And I defiled them by their gifts, as they passed all their firstborn through the fire, so that I might stun them, so that they know that I am Yahuwah. Thus says the Master Yahuwah, and this your fathers have further reviled me by committing trespass against me. They offered their slaughterings there and provoked me with their offerings. Now you may read this and think, well, he's talking about the firstborn sons, that they were making human sacrifices. And that may be the case, but if you, if you go and you actually look in the Hebrew at this verse in Ezekiel and then you compare it to the Torah, he's talking about all the firstborn that opened the womb. And that would not include just the human children. It would also include the, uh, all the animals. You were supposed to offer up the firstborn of your, of your flocks also. So this is not specifically just firstborn humans, but for all firstborn. And of course, the humans, they were supposed to redeem. Now, for the sake of, of, open, you know, of uh, full disclosure here, most English translations translate verse 25 that I gave them laws that were not good not that I gave them up to laws that were not good. However, we know that Yahuwah would never give us laws that were not good, and in fact, in the recognitions of Clement, Peter says that anything in the Torah that paints Yahuwah in a negative light is a corruption, or is a false statement inserted by the scribes. So by using Peter's instructions, we know that this can't be correct, because Yahuwah would not give commandments to make sacrifices that were not good. He would only give commandments that are good. So this would be evidence of a corruption or a false insertion. Okay, so now we're up to the prophet Micah. He says, With what shall I come before Yahuwah? Bow myself before the high Elohim? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings and with calves a year old? This, again, is a rhetorical question. You know, is Yahuwah pleased with thousands of rams or ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my being? All of these are rhetorical questions, and all of them beg the answer no. He has declared to you, O man, what is good, and what does Yahuwah require of you but to do right, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your Elohim? Again, it's the same doctrine, the same thing all the other prophets were saying. He doesn't desire sacrifices. He desires you to, to do what's right. Jeremiah 7. Thus says Yehu of hosts, the Elohim of Israel, add your burnt offerings to your sacrifices and eat the flesh. For in the day I brought them out of the land of Egypt, I did not speak to your fathers or command them concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now wait a minute. According to the Torah, he did. He did command them. You know, I mean, he's making this sarcastic statement. Go ahead and eat your burnt offerings. Go ahead. I didn't command you to do it. He goes on in verse 23, But this command I give them, obey my voice, and I will be your Elohim, and you shall be my people. And walk in all the way that I command you, that it may be well with you. But they did not obey or incline their ear, but walked in their own counsel and the stubbornness of their evil hearts, and went backward and not forward. I have persistently sent all my servants the prophets to them day after day, yet they did not listen to me. Does this sound familiar? Does this sound very very similar to a, uh, a parable that Yeshua gave about the vineyard? <clears throat> about how Yahuwah planted a vineyard and he sent his prophets to them? Well, here he's saying, I consistently, I persistently sent my servants the prophets to them. But then what does he follow it up with? He says, well, maybe they'll respect my son. In Yeshua's parable, that's what he said. 
So is there a connection between this and Yeshua's parable? You go on to Hosea, Hosea 6.4. What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? Your love is like a morning cloud, like the dew that goes away early. Therefore I have hewn the, I've, therefore I have hewn them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and my judgment goes forth as a light. For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of Elohim rather than burnt offerings. Again, you see this same principle. He's, he does not desire sacrifices. But like Adam, they have transgressed the covenant. They dealt faithlessly with me. Gilead, a city of evildoers, tracked with blood. Again, you have this reference to blood. And as for robbers, they lay, lie in wait for men. So that the priests band together. They murder on the way to Shechem. They commit felony. In the house of Israel, I have seen a horrible thing. Ephraim's whoredom is there. Israel is defiled. So, wait a minute, what is, what is Ephraim's whoredom that is in the temple? What is he talking about here, that the priests are murdering, and that they're, they're tracked with blood? It can't, could it be anything else other than the sacrifices? Going on on Hosea, he says, Because Ephraim has multiplied offers for sinning, they have become altars of sinning. Were I to write for him... My laws by the ten thousand, they would be regarded as a strange thing. As for my sacrificial offerings, they sacrifice meat and eat it, but Yahuwah does not accept them. Now he will remember the iniquity and punish their sins. They shall return to Egypt. So what is the abomination of, uh, of uh, Ephraim? Well, it tells you right here. It's because they are these sacrifices. And he doesn't accept it. Now, also, notice at the beginning of Hosea, he speaks about this covenant. He says, In that day, declares Yahuwah, you will call me my husband. You will no longer call me my Baal. For I will remove the names of the Baals from her mouth, and they shall be remembered by name no more. And I will make for them a covenant on that day with the beasts of the field. So he's making a covenant with Israel and with the animals. Keep that in mind. He's making it with the beasts of the field, the birds of the heaven, and the creeping things of the ground. And I will abolish the bow, the sword, and war from the land. I will make you lay down in safety. Now you may think, well, he's talking about Israel lying down in safety. But it's not just Israel. It's Israel and the animals. And I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice, justice and steadfast love and mercy. I will betroth you you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know Yahuwah. So he's guaranteeing safety for all the living creatures, not just the people. And again, you see the same thing in Isaiah 11. It says, A wolf shall die, uh, dwell with the lamb, a leopard lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child leads them. And a cow and bear shall feed, their young ones lie down together, and a lion eats straw like an ox. And the nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the adder's den. They do no evil, nor destroy in all my set-apart mountain. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of Yahuwah, as the waters cover the sea. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse standing as a banner to the people. Unto him the Gentiles shall seek, and his rest shall be esteemed. So, in this utopian vision... In both uh, Hosea and Isaiah, you see this uh, image of peace between the people and the animals. And interestingly enough, both Hosea and Isaiah are both closely related to the name of Yeshua. Um, you know, Hosea was actually the original name of uh, Joshua, son of Nun. And, of course, his name, Joshua, in, uh, in Hebrew, would have been Yahushua. Same thing with Isaiah, Yeshiahu. It's, it's very similar to, uh, it's still this, you know, Yeshua salvation. Both of these names reflect Yeshua. So, what's the mission of Yeshua? People, is it to, is it to restore Moses, to get us back to the, to the situation at Moses? I don't think so. I think that Yeshua's purpose and his mission 
is to get us back to the garden. So look at Genesis chapter 129. It says, Elohim said, See, I have given you, speaking to man, every plant that yields seed, which is on the face of the earth, and every tree who yields, um, whose fruit yields seed is to you for food, and to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, to every creeping creature on the earth in which there is life, every green plant is for food. So notice, it's not just mankind that was eating a vegetarian diet. It's all the animals were eating a vegetarian diet. He didn't have, uh, you know, lions and tigers eating other animals. They all ate uh, a vegetarian type of diet. So when we read that in Isaiah and Hosea, what what's being described there is just returning back to the same situation that you saw in the Garden of Eden. And of course, it says that it came to be so, and Elohim saw all that he had made. And see, it was very good. So this, uh, the the opinion, if you would, of Yahuwah about this situation where the entire planet was eating vegetables and, and no one was killing each other, in, in his words, it was very good. And in proof of the gospel, it was written by Eusebius of Caesarea. Eusebius, you if you've heard of him, you probably know him from his book, Ecclesiastical History. Eusebius was a bishop of Rome uh, at the time of the Council of Nicaea. He was definitely a, uh, a Catholic, you know, company man. I mean, he, he was a straight-up Catholic that was there to uphold the church and the Council of Nicaea. But in the proof of the gospel, he said this about the disciples. He says, Consider the character of the disciples of Yeshua, uh, for, from the men as they stand, surely any sensible person would be inclined to consider them worthy of all confidence, for they were admittedly poor men without eloquence. Uh, poor would, of course, be the ebionim, that's uh, Hebrew for poor. They fell in love with holy and philosophic instruction. They embraced and persevered in a uh, strenuous life and a laborious life with fasting and abstinence from wine and from meat. Uh, and much bodily restriction besides with prayers and intercessions to Elohim, and last but not least, excessive purity and devotion both of body and soul. Then again, it's from pr Proof of the Gospel, and you can find that for free on the internet. Just uh, Google PDF Proof of the Gospel and look in section 3.5, and you'll find this quote where even Eusebius, who was certainly not a vegetarian, uh, not an Ebionite, but even he admits that the apostles did not eat meat. So, at the end of the day, the question I think we should all ask ourselves is, what will the kingdom be like? And if you turn to Revelation 21, notice it says, And Elohim shall wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor mourning, nor crying, and there shall be no more pain, for the former matters have passed away. So notice that in the kingdom, Yahuwah specifically says that there will be no more death. So why would we think that in his temple he would demand that the people bring in living animals and cause death? So I ask you to watch part two. Uh, part two of this teaching actually gets more into what Yeshua said. You know, this, this particular presentation was more about what the prophets in the Tanakh said, but if you want to see what's actually said in the in the Brit Hadashah, I invite you to listen to part two. So thank you for joining me. Shalom.